So here we are on Monday, trying to figure out what the problem with the Minnesota Vikings is. Is it the offense? Is it the defense? Is it the coaching? Um, honest to God, from a Vikings fan perspective, and I think a lot of Vikings fans would agree with me, is that hope is the problem. If, you, if hope doesn't exist, it's easy to accept that this team is atrocious. Um, I, I think we've reached a flashpoint, or, or an inflection point, where next week we face the Falcons, who are 0-5. If we gift them the first win of the season, we're going to start taking part in conversations that are very difficult, that we don't want to have, because we are sort of used to the way things go around here. And that being the existence of who is in charge and who the star players are. As I said in the reaction video last night, this team is one to two years away from having to blow this up because they're not going to be able to afford this much longer. And if they don't get these draft picks to hit, you know, I, I you know, drafting 12 to 15 players a year is, is a fun, phenomenal time. But the likelihood that you're going to hit on all of those picks is just astronomically low. So, the Seahawks game. Why is this concerning going forward? And why should we be more upset than we are this morning? It feels like a lot of people are, you know, in the podcasts that I've watched and the radio interviews and uh, the radio phone calls that I've listened to in the last 24 hours, um, people are showing signs of desperation and malcontent, but it still seems like most people are like, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a thing, you know. But um, I, I think seriously, pr sooner than later, people are going to have to start um, answering for what's going on here, especially against the Falcons next week, because they're 0-5. If, if we come out of that 1-5, we're in trouble. Right now, I think, according to reverse order of standings, we hold the fourth overall pick in the draft. That is not where we're supposed to be this year. <laughs> this team is supposed to be competing for a divisional title. Um, so the Seahawks game, this is where it sort of begins. The stat that I saw last night that blew my mind is the time of possession. And in the preview video, in the game preview video, I said, you know, that was going to be important. The Vikings tempo, time of possession. We've come a long way since that first Green Bay game where we were only able to run 20 some plays or whatever it was. It was a statistically low number. Time of possession against the Seahawks is greater than 39 minutes. Up until last night, teams with possession of 39 minutes or more were 107, 14 and 1. 107 wins in the scenario the Vikings had last night against a 4-0 Seahawks team, and they lost. So the statistic is now 107-15-1. We are one of the 15 teams in the history of the league, as far, I don't know how far back, but to, to lose when dominating time of possession in the manner that we did. That's bad. Um, the Seahawks were 0-7 on third downs. Generally, when you get, when you force a team to punt every single time, or, you know, not convert third downs, um, you're probably in a position to win the game. Um, but instead, you know, and, and a lot of those fourth down, two of those fourth down conversions happened on that final drive, uh, one to keep the drive alive um, with the DK Metcalf 39-yard reception, and then the other one being the touchdown. The 21-point swing in two minutes in the third quarter is is just uh, is, is symbolic um, representation of what this Viking season is as a whole. You do all the right things and then just completely destroy it in the shortest amount of time possible. Kirk Cousins, and we'll get to him in a minute, with the two turnovers in enemy territory, you know, handing the ball over to a short field to an offense that is running on all cylinders, captained by an MVP candidate, is not how you win games. It, it really isn't. Then we come to the inflection point or the catalyst for this whole thing, and that is the fourth and one on the six at the end of the game. So analytics, the, the analytic side of this uh, suggests that this is the right call, even though the statistics say that it's a wash, according to ESPN, ESPN Next Gen Stats or whatever they are. So going for it uh, calculates that it, you give a 98% win probability making that call. Kicking the field goal gives you a 97.2% win probability. So it's a wash. And I am of the 
I am of the argument um, that you don't leave points on the field. And Mike Zimmer did that twice last night. The first is in the third quarter when he goes for the two-point conversion that he doesn't need to do at that point. It's too early to start chasing points like that. Um, kick the extra point, and then that doesn't come back to haunt you later. When you leave points on the field, you create this scenario world that we're in right now where we have to second-guess all of the decisions that you made up until that point. And this can all be easily avoided by just getting the points that are available to you at the time that they are, and then let the rest of the game unfold as it will. So, because of that, um, not getting that two-point conversion, he is presented with the opportunity to either A, kick the field goal, get the three points, uh, take it to an eight-point lead, or go for it in hopes that uh, they, they uh, convert. So, the pros and cons of going for it on fourth and one in that situation. Pro, you only need one yard. That's not too much to ask. You've been gutting the defense all day. Um, the run defense for the Seahawks has been pretty bad, and Alexander Madison has basically had his way with them. Dalvin Cook as well before he got injured. Um, it also keeps Russell Wilson off the field. You're likely going to win in the scenario that you get the first down. It now becomes first goal, and you can put the game away with uh, some good clock management or punching again for a touchdown. A uh, nightmare scenario in that situation is that you kick the field goal anyway, but there's less time left on the clock. Uh, cons of going for it on fourth and one. Well, it's obvious. You leave the points on the field. There's points available. You can attempt the field goal. That's three points. And then uh, the obvious one that happened was that Wilson takes over anyway, and now he only needs six points to win the game. Kicking the field goal... The, the pros are you get the three points and you lead by eight. The cons are Russell Wilson gets the ball anyway and uh, has more time than he would have had you had to actually execute the field goal and the kickoff. So here's the situation as I see it. Going for it on fourth and one might be the right call for some people. It's not for me. Um, the fact of the situation is that in this scenario, if you kick the field goal, you get the three points, you now, you now lead by eight. So instead of just a touchdown, the Seahawks now also need a two-point conversion. So they need to go uh, 75 yards, we'll call it a touchback on the kickoff, 75 yards, score the touchdown, and get the two-point conversion. Two-point conversion success rate in the league is 40 to 50%. I will take those odds. Um, not going for it presents the opportunity where if you don't get it, which they didn't, uh, now they need to go 94 yards and score a touchdown and nothing else. Now, so not going for it and so going for it and not converting uh, now creates a scenario where the Seahawks need to do one thing, score the touchdown. Kicking the field goal, going up by eight, now creates a scenario where they need to do two things, score the touchdown and the two point conversion, which as we can see by the success rate is a little bit more difficult. The one thing that bothers me is that everybody said that was arguing for the going for it uh, side of the argument was that a 94-yard drive to score a touchdown with under two minutes to go is improbable. This is the first time I've heard this argument in a long, long time. Because as we have always seen with games that feature Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, um, you know, so on and so forth, is that, oh no, they left them too much time. And it's it's just silly to me. So is it the, is it the extra, what, 19 yards, you know, 75 compared to 94, that's the big difference for you? Or is it the fact that you're assuming that playing for, you know, playing for the points and, you know, the worst case scenario is you tie and go to overtime as as some sort of, you know, you know loser mentality? I don't get it. I really don't get it. Um, so everybody is like, oh, it's, you know, go for it. It's safe. You know, it's improbable that Russell Wilson, the leading MVP candidate, is going to march his third ranked offense down the field in less than two minutes, which they've done how many times? Uh, it makes no sense to me. Like that argument to me has no ground to stand on. Um, it, it, now, if there is, if this is a different team, if we're playing a different team and let's say like the Detroit Lions are on the other side and it's Matthew Stafford, or if we're playing, um, the Colts and it's Philip Rivers on the other side. Go for it all day long because I don't have the, um, I, I guess you would say confidence that quarterbacks like Matthew Stafford and Philip Rivers at this point in their careers are going to 
um, engineer a 94 yard game winning drive. Russell Wilson, I understand that if you get the one yard, you keep the ball out of his hands, but he's going to get the ball anyway. So if he kicks the field goal, you get the three point cushion and there's a, and there's a few more seconds off the clock. It just seems a little ridiculous to me that people automatically assume that the, you know, taking the improbability of a 94 yard touchdown drive into account is enough to justify leaving points on the field. It just, it blows my mind. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, uh, that's where we start the blame game. Who do we have to blame for this? Mike Zimmer? Kirk Cousins, a little bit of both. Um, so I thought it would be fun to have some statistics. And this is also sort of um, a, a preview of probably where we're going. So with, um, you know, there, there was other questionable decisions other than the, the field goal, like the reverse to Adam Thielen, I thought was an odd play call. Um, you know, even the play call itself on fourth and one, where they ran right up the middle behind Drew Samia, who is the worst guard in the NFL. Uh, is questionable at best. I understand they were probably prepared for the left side run because they've been dominating on that side, but still at the same time, if he moved over, there was a pretty decent sized hole to the right of the fullback. Um, and then going for the two point conversion in the third, which we've already mentioned. Kirk Cousins was the catalyst for that 21 point swing in the third quarter, giving up the two turnovers, the interception and the fumble. Um, that can't happen. It's just, it's, it's become, it's become to a point and I've got some of his statistics right here on this season alone, 139 passing attempts, 31 in the league. So he's almost, um, almost attempted the fewest passes, uh, out of all quarterbacks in the league, seven interceptions. That's almost the most in the league. So the fewest, almost fewest of passing attempts leads to almost the most interceptions in the league. That's a red flag, eight touchdowns, seventh, 17th in the league, middle of the road. Um, Kirk Cousins is 19, 17, and 1 since coming to Minnesota in 2018. Um, that, to me, does not justify an $84 million guaranteed contract. I feel like we could have done better, probably with a rookie. Um, but I digress. <clears throat> One of the big points is um, sort of the uh, the arc of Zimmer's career in Minnesota as it relates to this game, this season, and uh, what he's done since he's been here. And he was correct in saying before the season started he's never had a bad defense. Um, the, I think the lowest ranked defense he's ever, uh, had in terms of points allowed was 11th overall. And I forget what season it was right now. We're 26 in points allowed. This defense is not good. Um, it, it's mostly a, a combination of new personnel and experience, but at the same time, he's a defensive guru. This is supposed to be his thing. There's not many of them left in the league. You look around the league and you start to feel jealous about all the offensive coordinator minded head coaches like Kevin Stefanski, Matt Rule, uh, Matt LaFleur, Andy Reid. Um, Sean McVay, you know, Sean Payton, just all over the league, you see these teams uh, leading through offense and then having the defense to back it up. Um, with the negative 20-point differential that we have so far in 2020, that's the worst and only negative point differential since Mike Zimmer's first year coaching Minnesota when he had an eight, finished the season with a negative 18-point differential, and they finished seven and nine. Um, so that is sort of where we're at. Um, am I calling for anybody to be fired? No, not quite just yet, but I think next week against the Falcons, if things don't turn around, that's when the seat gets really hot. That's when we start having problems because after that, the bye week, and I don't think that they're going to fire anybody, at least not this season, unless it gets drastically bad. We're talking like two and 14 is drastically bad. Three and 13 might still be okay. Um, but there's a lot of things that are probably going to need to change with this team because the window feels like it's shutting. Um, and you know, they have some, they have an easier slate of schedule, uh, slate of games coming up. The Atlanta Falcons, the Detroit Lions, Jacksonville Jaguars are on the docket. It just, it's going to depend on how many wins they can salvage out of the season. That feels like it's already lost and there's a lot of blame to go around for it. So that's going to do it for this video. It went a little longer, but I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one.